Hello everybody, I am Tom and you are watching my speculative class guide series for Larian Studios' upcoming Baldur's Gate 3. As noted, because Baldur's Gate 3 is not out yet and we don't know everything, this video is speculative. This is based off the Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition rule set, which Larian has said they're going to base their own rule set off as closely as practical, so I feel pretty confident using it as a baseline for these videos. If you're unaware of any of the basic concepts around D&D or Baldur's Gate more generally, I have a tutorial kind of video about the basics of D&D that you can find right here or in the description. But without further ado, today we're going to take a look at... The Monk is by far the most anime of all the classes in D&D. They're a primarily martial class that, well, punches shit? Now, there's obviously more to it than that, but essentially the monk is a hand-to-hand -hand combatant that uses the pseudo-magical force of ki, which is sourced from kind of peace of body and mind. But this empowers their body and their strikes and enhances their agility so they can traverse the battlefield with leaps and bounds. As always, I'll go over the skills in order of appearance, starting off with the inherent features. First off, for hit dice, the monk has a 1d8 for hit dice. This means that at first level they have 8 hit points plus their constitution modifier, and at every subsequent level they get Either roll a d8 or take the average of 5 and add your constitution modifier per level above first. As far as proficiencies, they're not proficient in any armor. In fact, they actually excel at not wearing any armor whatsoever. That's kind of their thing. But they have proficiency in all simple weapons as well as short swords. As far as tools go, you can choose one type of artisan's tool or a musical instrument and you gain proficiency in that. I don't really know why this comes in. I guess the idea of being kind of body and mind... Maybe through music you learn? I don't know. I don't really understand why they give you this, but I guess they just do. As far as saving throws, you're proficient in strength and dexterity. And as far as skills go, you choose two from either acrobatics, athletics, history, insight, religion, or stealth. Starting at level 1 as a monk, you'll gain unarmored defense. Whenever you're not wearing armor and have no shield, your armor class will be equal 10, plus your dex modifier, plus your Wisdom modifier. As Dex and Wisdom are the main ability scores you're going to be focusing on as a monk, this will make you rather hard to hit as just a baseline level. Additionally, you gain Martial Arts. This is a feature that allows the monk to use their Dex modifier rather than their Strength modifier when they're using either their fists or so-called monk weapons. For specificity, monk weapons are short swords and all simple weapons that aren't either two-handed or heavy. So you can use small weapons as long as they're simple or short swords and you can use your dex modifier with all of them rather than using your strength modifier when you're hitting things. Your unarmed strikes as a monk, i.e. your punches and your kicks, do 1d4, and this goes up as you level up. As you can see on the table, that will have up right now. And finally, when you take the attack action, you can use your bonus action to do an additional unarmed strike. So, say you're using a short sword for instance, you can hit someone with your short sword, you can then as a bonus action, punch him in the head. When you reach level 2, you gain two more important features. Firstly, you gain un unarmored movement. Your movement speed is increased by 10 feet. This bonus will go up with level, adding an additional 5 feet at level 6, and then another 5 feet at level 10 for a total of 20 additional feet of movement. Also, once you reach level 9, you can, as long as this is in one solid movement and it's within your speed range, run up vertical inclines and across water. So, at a level 10 monk, you can run up to 20 feet high wall, you can just run straight up it with no impediment, and you can run across 40 foot span of water without falling in. Hardcore parkour! Also at level 2, you gain key manipulation. You have a number of key points determined by your monk level. These can be spent to do certain key features. All of your key points are returned to you at the end of either a short or a long rest, so you can get them back fairly frequently, so you should be using them pretty much as much as possible. Also at level 2, you will start out with three key features you can perform. Firstly, you have Flurry of Blows. You spend a key point to do two unarmed strikes as a bonus action rather than one. So you can hit a guy, use your Flurry of Blows, and then pop pop, hit him again. Next, you have Patient Defense. You can spend one key point to take the dodge action as a bonus action on your turn. What the dodge action does means that any attack against you for the next turn has disadvantage, makes you very hard to hit. And next, we have Step of the Wind. You can spend a key point that allows you to take either the disengage or the das dash action on your turn as a bonus action. And also, as a side note, your jump distance is doubled, which is quite cool. Next up, at level 3, you un your unlock your subclass, or your monastic tradition. I'll go through all these a little later. However, also at level 3, you gain the deflect missiles feature. It's one of the cooler monk abilities in my opinion. If you're hit with a range attack, you can use your reaction to attempt to catch the arrow mid-flight, or at least slow it down so it reduces the damage you take. Mechanically, what this does, 
The game will do all of it for us, however, for those interested in the math behind it, it is a 1d10 plus your dex modifier plus your monk level, and that damage is then reduced. If it reaches zero, then the arrow is caught and you take no damage. If you successfully do catch the arrow, or strictly speaking, any projectile, it doesn't have to be an arrow. Um, if someone throws a shoe at you, you can catch the shoe and do the same thing. But you can spend a key point to immediately throw it back. Really cool. It's, it's fantastic. Someone throws a, shoots an arrow at you, you can catch the arrow and throw the arrow back at him. It's amazing. It's really flavorful and one of the coolest abilities, in, in my opinion. It's just amazing. Next up, we have level four. And at level four, the monk gains the ability to lighten their landing when they fall from really long distances. Whenever you take fall damage, you can use your reaction to reduce the damage you take by five times your monk level. Also, as a reference, fall damage in 5th edition, so we can assume it's going to be the same in Baldur's Gate 3, but it's calculated as 1d6 damage per 10 feet fallen, and that maxes out at a maximum of 200, uh, sorry, uh, 20d6, which is 200 feet. It's interesting in D&D because the fall damage is kind of incongruent when you get to higher levels, um, there's many characters at high levels that can survive 20d6, like even at max damage, if you get like 120 damage, there's a lot of characters that can survive that. The monk could do it at even lower levels. So with this feature, a full health level 15 monk will survive a fall from any height. Always. I mean, it'll hurt, no doubt, but literally just jumping off a cliff is a sound strategy for mid to high tier D&D, it's ridiculous. Uh, also worth noting is you get an ability score improvement at level 4 as well as level 8, as with all characters. But, moving on to level 5, at level 5 you gain the extra attack feature. We've seen this one before, but whenever you make an attack action, you can instead make two attacks instead of one. You also gain access to Stunning Strike. Stunning Strike is very, very good. You can spend a key point to attempt to stun an enemy with your melee attack. Your enemy must succeed on a constitution saving throw or be stunned until the end of your next turn. This does sound good off its face, but stunned isn't just good, it is one of the best controls in the entire game. A creature that is stunned, one, cannot move or attack, it can only speak in kind of incomprehensible garble, automatically fails any strength or dexterity saving throw, and all attacks against it have advantage. That's all from one status condition, it's absolutely ludicrous. But moving on to level 6, you gain key empowered strikes. You get magical fists, baby! <laughs> Essentially, by imbuing your fists with key, you can overcome creatures that have magical resistances or immunities, such as ghosts. You can punch ghosts. Piss off, ghost. Then going on to level 7, you gain the evasion feature. This allows you to better avoid area of effect spells and abilities, such as a dragon's breath or a fireball spell. Anytime you're forced to make a dexterity saving throw, if you succeed, you take no damage whatsoever, and if you fail, you only take half damage. So all AoE damage pretty much all of it is just halved for your character, and you have a chance to avoid all of the damage, which most characters do not. If someone get, hits you with a fireball, most characters are going to take at least half that damage or all of it. Whereas if you have evasion, you can just step out of the way and you're fine. Additionally, at level 7, you gain the Stillness of Mind feature. This allows you to use your action to end a charmed or frightened effect on you just through kind of force of will. So if someone charms you, you can just on your turn just say, no I'm not. Pretty cool actually. And finally we have the level 10 ability, you gain purity of body. This gives you immunity to all disease and all poison. That's a really powerful feature as poison can have some serious effects in D&D and by extension Baldur's Gate 3. Next we can move on to the monastic traditions. So first we have the way of the open hand. The most straightforward of monk subclasses in my eyes, they're really good at beating people up with their fists. That's kind of what they do. At level 3 when you choose a subclass, your flurry of blows, so where you can do two unarmed strikes, unarmed strikes after you do a melee attack, is powered up. So it's just better whenever you use it. Whenever you hit an enemy with one of your unarmed strikes from flurry of blows, you can either attempt to knock them prone, they're forced to make a dexterity saving throw, if they fail, they're prone, you attempt to push them 15 feet away from you, they're forced to make a strength saving throw in that case, or you can prevent it from making any reactions on its next turn. And this has no save whatsoever. Effectively, you just hit it and it can no longer take reactions. Very, very useful. Next up, when you hit level 6 as a way of the open hand monk, you gain the ability to heal yourself using key. Just as an action, you regain uh, hit points equal to three times your monk level. You can do this once per long rest, but you can just heal yourself up three times whatever your monk level is. So you're level 5, 
You can just heal 15 hit points as an action. Quite good. Uh, the rest of the features come after level 10 for the subclasses of Monk. We're not entirely sure what the level cap of Baldur's Gate 3 is. Um, it's worth noting that it was originally stated to be level 10, but they've come out now and they're saying, eh, it's not so clear cut now. We may go a bit over that. Hell, we may go a bit under that. I'm not entirely sure. I think if anything, they're going to go over. I think the problem they're having is they've got so much content that they want to spread out the levels a bit. Um, we'll see. I'm just going to go to level 10 in these videos because it's what I've done with the previous ones and I think I'm going to stick to that formula. So, moving on then, we have the Way of Shadows. Uh, as you no doubt guess, monks from this tradition excel at stealth and sub subterfuge. Way of Shadows is a pretty- it's, it gives away the name in the name quite well, really. But starting at level 3, you gain Shadow Arts. So, as an action, you can expend two key points to cast one of the following spells. Darkness, Dark Vision, Pass Without a Trace, and Silence. I won't get into these like too in depth mechanically, but as basic ideas, darkness makes a big area dark, dark vision allows you to see in the dark, pass without a trace makes you and your entire group much stealthier, and silence will mute an area so there's no sound in the area that you cast the spell on. Along with these spells you also learn the cantrip Minor Illusion. So you just get these spells effectively that you can cast with key points. At 6th level you gain Shadow Step, one of the coolest abilities out of any like just class abilities that I think exists in my mind. Essentially, this allows you to teleport up to 60 feet as long as your starting point and ending point of the teleport is at least dimly lit or dark. It's, it's ridiculous. If you're just standing in some shade, you can just teleport 60 feet away into another dimly lit area. It's, it's huge. Absolutely huge. And finally, we have Way of the Four Elements. You're pretty much the Avatar. I mean, you're basically Aang. You're a monk from, the tr from this tradition, they can manipulate key to cast kind of elemental magic spells and do elemental effects. But starting level 3 you gain magical disciplines. Um, I'll list all of these in a second, um, at least all of these that are relevant. But at level 3 you know 2, one of your choice as well as the elemental attunement discipline. At level 6 you get one more of your choice. I'll now go over and list them all, I'll just list the ones that you can get up to level 10. There's a few that take, um, you can get but you can't get them until higher levels. Uh, so I won't list those ones, but we'll start out with the one that you absolutely have to get, which is Elemental Attunement. You can use your action to briefly control elemental forces within 30 feet of you, causing one of the following effects of your choice. Um, worth noting this one does not cost a key point, I do not believe. You create a harmless instantaneous sensory effect related to air, earth, fire or water, such as a shower of sparks, a puff of wind, a spray of light mist or a gentle rumbling of stone. Or you can instantaneously light or snuff out a candle, a torch, or a small campfire. Chill or warm up one pound of non-living material for up to one hour. Cause earth, fire, water, or mist that can fit within a one foot cube to shape itself into a crude form you designed for one minute. A lot of these effects are effectively very similar to the prestidigitation spell. Um, you can kind of do minor magical effects. Specifically the ones that are to do with wind, water, earth, or the other one, fire. Um, I don't know how I forgot fire, that's probably the most elemental of elements, isn't it? Moving on, we have Clench of the North Wind. You need to be level 6 before you can choose this one, but you can spend 3 key points and it allows you to cast Hold Person, which is a spell that, as you might expect, effectively paralyzes someone, you stop them from moving. Next we have Fangs of the Fire Snake. When you use the attack action on your turn, you can spend 1 key point to cause tendrils of flame to stretch out from your fists and feet. Your reach with your unarmed strikes increases by 10 feet for that action, as well as, the rest of, uh, as well as for the rest of your turn. A hit with such an attack deals fire damage instead of bludgeoning damage, which makes sense. And you can spend one additional key point when the attack hits, that you can do an additional 1d10 fire damage. Next we have Fist of the Four Thunders. You can spend two key points to cast Thunder Wave. Thunder Wave is essentially force push, for want of a better term. It's, it's effectively force push, that's what Thunder Wave is. Uh, next we go on to Fist of Unbroken Air. This one is kind of wordy, but we'll go into it. You can create a blast of compressed air that strikes like a mighty fist. As an action, you can spend two key points to choose a creature within 30 feet of you. That creature must make a strength saving throw. On a failed save, the creature takes 3d10 bludgeoning damage, plus an additional 1d10 for each additional key point that you spend. And you can also push the creature up to 20 feet away from you and knock it prone. On a successful save, the creature takes half as much damage and they're not pushed back and they're not knocked prone. But essentially, it's oddly, it's quite similar to using Thunder Wave. They're kind of similar. 
Um, the difference being Thunder Wave is kind of an area in front of you, whereas Unbroken Air is a longer distance. You can do it with someone who's 30 feet away from you, but you can do it only on one creature. Next, we have Gong of the Summit. You need to be level 6 for this one as well, but you can spend 3 key points to cast Shatter. I can't exactly remember what Shatter does. Give me a second, I'll look it up. Okay, and I'm back. Shatter is effectively just a Thunder spell that does a huge amount of uh, AoE damage. Well, it does a bunch of AoE damage in an area and it just makes a very, very loud sound that, like, breaks people's eardrums, effectively. Next, we have Rush of the Gale Spirits. You can spend two key points to cast Gust of Wind. Gust of Wind is, once again, one of those abilities that's kind of like a, a force push. Um, it's in a big line, rather than in, like, a big area. Um, you do, like, a big straight line of wind that shoots out from you. It's interesting. Um, it doesn't do a any damage from memory, but it does disperse fire or gases and things like that. So it does have some uh, some out of combat uses, as well as kind of pushing enemies out of the way. So it does have in combat uses, but I've usually seen it used out of combat. Next, we have Shape of the Flowing River. This is the wordiest and the most next to useless one, as far as I'm concerned, uh, that you can choose. But as an action, you can spend one key point to choose an area of ice or water no larger than f 30 feet on a side, within 120 feet of you. Already that's confusing, but I'll get into it in a sec. You can change water to ice within the area, and vice versa. You can reshape the ice in the area in any manner you choose. You can raise or lower the ice's elevation, create or fill in a trench, erect or flatten a wall, form a pillar. The extent of any such change can't exceed half the area's largest dimension. For example, if you affect a 30-foot square, you can create a pillar that's up to 15 feet high. Raise or lower the square's elevation by up to 15 feet, dig a trench up to 15 feet deep, so on. You can't shape the ice or trap uh, to trap or damage a creature within it. So you can't like switch up someone inside water and freeze them solid. Um, honestly, if you got rid of that limitation at the end of it, this would be fantastic. Spend a key, spend a key point and you've essentially got to control a water spell. Um, it's odd to me they didn't just have spend two key points and cast Control Water. It seems like that would have been a better way of doing it, because there is a spell called Control Water that does effectively this, but has less limitations. Um, I don't know why they didn't give that to you. Next, we have Sweeping Cinder Strike. You can spend two key points to cast Burning Hands. Burning Hands is just a basic fire attack, effectively. And then finally, we have Water Whip. You can spend two key points as an action to create a whip of water that shoves and pulls a creature to unbalance it. A creature that you can see within 30 feet must make a dexterity saving throw. On a failed save, the creature takes 3d10 bludgeoning damage, plus an extra 1d10 for each additional key point that you spend, and you can either knock them prone or pull it up to 25 feet closer to you. On a successful save, the creature takes half as much damage and you don't pull it or knock it prone. So essentially it's, I mean it's straight up water whip from Avatar, it's pretty cool. But that's it for all the features. Now onto my recommendations. The monk excels with dexterity and wisdom, so these should definitely be your primary ability scores. Um, focus both of them almost equally, in my mind. Um, dexterity probably slightly edges out wisdom, but honestly, I do both equally if I'm doing a monk. Uh, to that end, wood elves are particularly good race choice here, as they gain plus two to dexterity and plus one to wisdom. Uh, so that's a quite a good race choice. Also, we know that the gith yankee are in the game, so I'm also going to assume that the githrazai are in here. Um, they're essentially two sub-races of the overarching Gith race, but the Gith Zerai, it's hard to say that word, the, the Gith Zerai get a plus one intelligence, but they also get a plus two into wisdom, which is quite good. As for secondary stats, it is again a class where as long as you've got the main two ability scores covered, the rest of them are kind of personal choice. I mean, constitution is always nice, I'm going to say this with every class effectively, but having more HP is always better, particularly for a melee fighter. However, the monk does focus on not getting hit, more so than having a boatload of HP to get hit and then they're fine. So secondary abilities are really down to personal choice. But that's it for the monk. We're done. If you like this video, please leave a like. If you aren't subscribed, please consider subscribing. As always, thank you for watching, and I shall see you next time with the Paladin. Lawful Stupid, here we come. Bye, guys. <laughs>